Well, I've been thinking about doing this for a while, so here it finally is. About a year and a half ago, I got to go to the San Diego Zoo and check out, check out a wildlife conservation lab where one of my dad's patients works. Now, uh, that left me with a lot of takeaways, but unfortunately I didn't have any footage or pictures of the lab or anything they were doing there. I didn't think to whip out my phone and, you know, videotape anything. And even if I did, I might not have been allowed to, so... Oh well. I just whipped up some CGI visuals to fill in the blank spots like I usually do. Their main project is conserving a type of African rhino, and their lab is involved in a tremendous amount of other work for other global networks of biologists and conservationists. I'll delve into what they're doing in the San Diego Zoo and share some ideas for technological upgrades I think would help them. You know, it would help them to keep various species from falling into complete extinction, which is kind of the point of their lab. Or, at the very least, it would make their lives easier. You know. However, the situation's a bit more urgent now. Considering the lockdowns in place, people haven't been going to the San Diego Zoo, which is the source of income for the lab. The conservation programs are non-profit. If they don't get funding now, there's a lot of people who could lose their jobs, including the researchers and caretakers, keeping these endangered animals from going extinct. I'll leave a link to their donation page in the description below. It is endextinction.org. If you want to type it in yourself, it is www.endextinction.org. I'm not one to ask for subscribers or likes or shares. But for this video, I urge you, share it and post it wherever you can, or at least talk about it and share the link. Just this once. And if you got some spare cash, consider donating. The livelihood of these researchers depends on donations, and the lives of endangered species depends on these researchers. Look up the northern white rhino and you'll find that there's very few left. In fact, when I went to the zoo back in January of 2019, there were, and still are, only two northern white rhinos alive today. They are mother and daughter. The last male had sadly passed away by the time I visited. He was the father and grandfather of the females, respectively. For any other species, they'd be done for, but not the northern white rhino. They were brought to California from Africa and are now housed with the only other white rhino species in existence, the Southern African white rhino. This is where it gets interesting. The San Diego Zoo has a non-profit lab for species preservation and cellular biology called the Nikita Khan Rhino Rescue Center. They're sharing DNA samples from many other species, including a Northern white rhino with research labs all over the world. And the way they're doing it is rather interesting. Some of the samples from various species are getting DNA sequenced, and each lab gets to keep and trade certain samples and certain amounts of samples from each species. Samples which can be shipped out to a lab anywhere else in the world if needed. Which is interesting, because the vials, I mean, this is from a chemistry set, but this is kind of what the vials look like. You know, something small in there and about this size. Just an interesting visual. At the San Diego Zoo, they have six southern white rhinos, and they plan to use some of the females as surrogates. But the researchers are not combining the two rhino species' DNA. Not completely, anyway. They're not taking samples completely from the southern white rhino males. They're comparing the DNA of southern white rhinos and northern white rhinos to see where they overlap, as well as checking older northern white rhino DNA samples to see if they're still viable. From there, they can take eggs from the remaining two northern females every fucking time. From there, they can take eggs from the remaining two northern females, artificially inseminate the eggs with prepared DNA samples, and then use southern white rhinos as surrogate mothers. There were a few southern white rhinos born at the zoo, so that's 
They've proven they can successfully use IVF to breed southern white rhinos. They had to test that first. It's not long before they can expand this to northern white rhinos. Word of advice from the researchers, by the way. You can't do ultrasound on a rhino from the outside. The skin's too thick. You gotta stick your arm in there. Stick your whole arm in. And when they've had enough, <laughs> they clench. So me and my family got to visit the lab after walking through the zoo, and we got to see some of the equipment they were using at the lab, as well as how they store and distribute samples. They worked on cryonic storage of cells, which is tricky because each species has their own special version of the same cells. They behave differently from each other at various temperatures, which makes the work more complicated. Samples that are stored are kept in these giant liquid nitrogen doers to preserve them, and man those things are trippy. They, you'd expect the air around the opening to be cold when they open the chambers, and it is, but it's surprising just how cold the air around the top really is, and the onset of that cold is very, very sudden. It's like from two inches of travel, you move your hand in, it's like, okay, really cold, holy shit. So it's, it's so weird with liquid nitrogen because the temperature gradient is so sharp. Now in those doors, they have these small metal baskets full of vials and they basically, they, they hang that inside. They don't really dip all the way down into the liquid nitrogen, but you got like a basket with a bunch of little vials in there and you just, it's like a wire mesh basket. It's really interesting. And they, and they have to be very careful about freezing the samples because if they freeze them too quickly, ice crystals can form in the cells and tear them apart, which basically just kills them. You, you lose your samples that way if you're not careful. The researchers giving us the tour also showed us their incubator system, which basically looks like a giant refrigerator almost, and they talked about how they keep the cells alive. The rhino cells are grown in these petri trays, and the individual compartments are absolutely tiny. They're these tiny cylindrical holes, it's smaller than a quarter and around a half an inch deep. They're also studying the limits of cell division for stem cells, which are essentially just blank slate cells that our bodies can quickly convert into different types of tissue cells. Over millions of years, stem cells have evolved to rapidly specialize, which is great for the rapid growth of a fetus's body during gestation. It's not so great when you want to grow a bunch of stem cells without defects, because they're prone to just go and screw it, you know, they just do their own thing. If they don't get switched into a particular cell type fast enough, or they get stressed, they usually get tired of waiting and they switch themselves into a specialized kind of cell. And once that happens, it's possible to lose an entire batch of stem cells to an uncontrollable cascade of cell specialization. If you ever see heart, uh, liver, and kidney cells randomly strung together in your petri dish, that was probably a stem cell accident. And it's interesting because they also put a special rod-shaped type of cell in with the cells they're trying to incubate and grow. These rod-shaped cells are called fibroblasts because they look like little fibers. What they do is they feed each compartment with a little bit of sugar water with nutrients in it and this is called growth medium. And the fibroblasts are able to process the sugar and nutrients into something that the rhino stem cells can use. This doesn't last tremendously long since those fibroblasts can stop dividing and start dying off after a week or two if they're not happy. So fairly regular maintenance is required. It's not uncommon for one of the lab workers to have to run in quickly on the weekends so the cells get fed, checked, and cared for. A lot of the researchers are women, and they've admitted this kind of emergency has ruined date night more than once. Well, at least they have date night. They also showed us how they thaw out their samples with a bowl of water. They load the samples in the tubes, they get a bowl of water, and they just stir it by hand. They just keep doing this. They just wave it around and gauge it. They just this is it. This is their life for the next half hour. Just... Yeah. 
Wonderful use of time for conservationist researchers with actual fucking college degrees. Yeah, they can't even afford interns to do this. The actual researchers have to take time out of their busy schedule and do this. Lovely. My arm is getting tired doing this. In fact, if anything, this tedious work has become their main bottleneck. There's just so much setup and maintenance required that it's actually slowing them down. And they've also got some IT issues due to obsolete computers and software bugs. They're still running Windows 7 and their computers are clogged with dust. Like seriously, like they, if they, the one, like I've told you before, my dad's a doctor and I said one of the people who works there is one of his patients. She gave us a tour of the lab. She took a Petri tray out of the incubator and went to put it under the microscope and it took like an entire minute from waving the mouse to the computer waking up. It took a long time. There's a few reasons why these problems probably aren't going to get resolved anytime soon. One, they work at a zoo, not the geek squad section of Best Buy. And even though the zoo has an IT department, they're all the way across the property. Two, they're non-profit and they rely almost exclusively on grants and donations to keep operating. Once again, link, on the, uh, link in the description. Consider donating, consider helping. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm studying engineering, either mechanical or industrial design to be more exact. Needless to say, when I saw what they had to work with, I started thinking immediately about what they could use to improve their process. And I've thought of a few things that might help make their work a little less tedious, featuring a new incubator system and a new thawing system for pairing the samples. Some of you are probably a little bummed out that I didn't talk more about the rhino conservation efforts. Maybe some of you wanted more information on the biology involved, or more news about the northern white rhinos, or maybe even some footage or pictures, and I'm sorry I can't provide that. It's been about a year and a half since I was there, and even when I was there, a third of what they told us went straight over my head. And believe me when I tell you, they were talking about stuff you normally don't learn until you go to college, like med school or bio grad levels. So only missing a third is pretty good, all things considered. It also means I read my high school bio textbook out of sheer boredom one too many times in the middle of class. Autism. It's a magical thing, isn't it? There are a few options I've come up with. Some smart, some not so smart. I've whittled down things to at least one option I want to pursue when it comes to incubators, and some of you already know from the other videos on my channel, I built my own computer. I'm a computer guy to some extent. <clears throat> Took a little break from it for a bit, but this is what drove me thinking. This is what got the noggin jogging. I think someone could turn old server racks and computer cases into self-contained feeders and incubators and mimic computer hardware standards to make the tech more accessible and easier to adopt. If the design works well, you can mass produce petri trays the size of hard drives. They could be cheap, abundant, convenient to use. Not to mention, as technology gets better, we might be able to bake or print electronics directly into the trays or mount additional hardware on the bottom side, meaning you could get real-time analytics, automated sample regulation driven by probe readings, which helps limit sample contamination by not having to remove the trays as often. The software interface, mainly SATA, is already well known. The shape and dimensioning for the hardware already exists. Really, it's just a matter of doing a little workshop tinkering, figuring out what works and what doesn't. When you're working in a lab and studying how different cells from different species behave, easy access to your samples is crucial, as well as easy organization. This is doable with labels and certainly easy enough if you use a standard incubator or buy one of those fancy proprietary systems that already exists, but I want to try and knock out multiple problems in one fell swoop. It's got to be cheap, it's got to be versatile, and it's got to be abundant and easy to use. 
What if you bake an integrated circuit in the tray? Now you have a programmable digital label with the added benefit of storing specifications for conditions your cell batch needs to survive. And it is customizable for every batch you whip up. Next issue. Both the stem cells and the fibroblasts eat away most or all of the nutrients in the growth medium they live in, and it must be replenished somehow. The researchers can't add powdered nutrients in and stir it up. That'll separate the cells and leave them basically sitting in their own waste, which is not a good thing. They have to drain the depleted medium first and replace it. The upside is the cells tend to cling to the sides and bottoms of the petri dishes, making this easy. If you dome the bottoms of the dishes and use retractable pipettes, one set for injection, one set for extraction, this becomes a lot easier. Suck out the depleted medium and inject the fresh. When docked, the trays and sleds they're mounted to can form an airtight seal with the bay, keeping out pathogens, although I'm still trying to figure that part out. Yeah, when I was recording in the other room, I wasn't really happy with how I talked about using a computer as an incubator. So I figured, hey, why not hop over here, use an example I've already got, and you know, show you what I got in mind. So this is where the computers come into the mix. So the idea here, and don't worry about this, if it ever does get made, you could have a smaller card in as an accelerator, or just skip it entirely to pull this out. The entire idea is, well, you've got multiple spots to put in the hard drives. Now, if you look from the front, you can see there's a big fan here, but this is an older design. Most cases are a little more like this, but all the way down. So you'd have a hard drive cage going all the way down. Now there's usually a bit of spare room. Now that could be packed with insulation or used for wiring for your SATA data cable and power cable. Now, the way this entire design is supposed to work is you have fixed receptacles and the front would be accessible where you could take it in and out. You could take your tray, let's just use this as a tray representation, take it out and plug it in. So the entire idea would be that with an ATX model, you could bolt your uh, growth medium mixer down here. You could have data running to a board. And if you don't want your computer in here and you want to seal all this up, just grab a cable and route data to an outside computer. Now, if you want to go with the server approach, it is a little different. You get better packing density, and I've got a NAS kind of just roughly blocked out here. You've got your tray, you've got your injector box, your injector unit, data going to the computer, and the dark green is what I'll call the utilities, the fresh air, growth medium, that stuff. You could have a unit inside, and you'd flow water in, or just go with external utilities. So the crisis I'm kind of having right now is figuring out how to mount the pipettes because they'd be up in here, curl up kind of like a mosquito beak and release to dip down into the fluid and curl back up when the actuator is off to get out of the way. Because of the small flow rates, microfluidic systems should be considered and that's a tricky problem to make sure the flow rates are even, pressures even, make sure there's full extraction and injection and you know, make sure it's reliable. It's not impossible, but for the time being, it's one of the things that goes right over my head. Now the question is, do you mount it to the case? Because the unit would be about the size of your tray, just mounted in the bay above, which means less modifying the case, because you have to dremel out some uh, components that go across there if that's the way it's set up. I mean, that's a NAS design. That's how you're supposed to do it. Each bay is structurally its own spot. So if you go with that approach, well, then this makes more sense because you're not cutting away at your case. But the problem with doing it with a server is sometimes they're this tall, they're single drive height or possibly double. That's kind of average and the board would go all the way across. So that might be a challenge. Depending on the case size, I mean, you could, you could cut the side of the case. You can cut the panel that would be up here off and just have this sticking out. But now we run into a problem here. If you have it hooked up here, this means you need essentially a sealed exclusion area here to seal off the bays, or you would need to keep the entire case blocked off. But 
if we do this a little differently, and we instead use a lid like I was talking about, I'll show some SolidWorks footage right here as a sort of overlay. You can see the injectors, the gasket or o-ring that goes around, you can see the lid that everything's mounted in. A lot of that stuff is just kind of a rough representation. Uh, but basically, if you go with this approach where the lid actually snaps on to the tray, well, that keeps you from spilling it over when you take it out and put it back in again later. But it also means that it's already contained. You've already got a nice, clean, sterile environment maintained. You just have to figure out how to design the inlet and outlet ports that go around to the back. Oh, don't tie on me now. The inlet and outlet ports that go to the back here. You gotta make sure those are reliable now and make sure you don't have contamination or bacteria getting in. Because again, you're dealing with stem cells. There's no immune system there to fight off any sort of invasive bacteria. But regardless, however it's set up, you have your connection to go to the rest of the case. And this already keeps your samples, for the most part, clean and reliably safe. Now, if you do want to go with the server approach, you could basically put your utilities down there and then have multiple server chassis stacked inside what's called a rack or rack cabinet. You put a bunch of insulation on the sides, that's the red stuff here and here, to maintain a general warm temperature. And then you take your tray and mounting to the bottom, you put a heating pad controlled by your included circuit. So that will bring the samples up to spec for each cell batch that you work with. And again, you can simply take the computers outside the case if it's really a problem, if it gives the IT guys too much of a thermal nightmare to work with, take it and just route your cable outside to your computer somewhere else. You let the main computer, either in the case or wired in from outside, do all the control work, and now your project becomes scalable. Imagine the potential of a computer managing dozens of experiments, hundreds of samples, work that would all previously have to be managed, micromanaged more specifically, by a human attendant whose time is better spent somewhere else. Using a SATA approach like this is also pretty convenient because the way I have it working sort of in my mind is you're dealing with a really small circuit that doesn't have to drive a big heavy disk array in here. What you have is a huge set of disks magnetized and used that way to store information. But if you're dealing with basically just a tiny solid state board or solid state drive, the, the energy requirement is basically non-existent. It's ridiculously simple, meaning you could genuinely, let me see if I got this right, you could plug this in on a tabletop and hook it up straight to a laptop or to a desktop computer, whatever you need to do. Just plug it in, get your data, unplug, take it out and put it in your incubator. And that's easy enough, which is why going with the SATA system is a really convenient choice. So even if you do upgrade your incubator over the years or need to move to higher bandwidth or whatever you need, it's just you take out the board, put a new one in, and you're up to speed. Or you take your tray, you swap out the components that are placed on the bottom, or you throw it away and get this year's uh, tray design instead of last year's or five years ago's tray design, and there you go, you're off to the races. By automating the feeding process, there's more time for actual data collection and research to occur in the labs. With enough advancement, and given the rate at which embedded and printed circuits are improving, including a few carbon technology developments, these trays could also be fitted with equipment. Temperature probes, scanners, chemical sensors baked right into the tray, or with the exception of chemical sensors bolted onto the bottom after the fact. Now this all seems a bit unnecessarily expensive. You're messing around with, you know, a server case or a computer case that would definitely need to be modified and brought up to spec as an incubator. I mean, they're not built as incubators for a reason. But this is where it gets clever. Because you've already minimized, or because we've already minimized the amount of reinventing that needs to happen here, it's basically just, okay, go to the manufacturer if this becomes popular enough, or if the idea is a good enough one to 
make an agreement with a manufacturer or a service provider of some kind to say, hey, take a couple of these cases off the production line. Don't cut this hole. Don't worry about these holes here, these gaps here. And let's do a different front panel built a little differently. Let's put side panels on that are packed with insulation, modified very slightly. So you take a little bit out from their existing production line, you earmark a few and pull them out and do that work. And it's up and ready to go. Then it goes into its own sort of production line where you're using, once again, you're back to standard components. You're back to fairly standard components, standard protocols, standard design features. This makes it easy for industry to adjust rapidly to get right on board with it. And especially with the, with the servers, well, that definitely would take a bit of work. So this makes it quick to get adopted and get up to speed and competitive with the proprietary companies that will have their own solutions. They have, you know, sort of a, a box kind of like this with a very uh, custom arrangement. I don't know if they have injectors. I think you still have to have those be brought out and then you go in with a pipette and you inject your mixture. But this would take care of that very quickly. So it's configurable, it's totally doable. And then even for making the cabinet, it's a very slight modification. Usually in the back, you have mesh or some kind of filter for dust as a door or panel on the back. Just say, hey, screw it, give me a solid panel. Don't perforate it yet. Front panel, just acrylic, boom, you're done. And it's not that difficult for industry to adjust to do that. The biggest headache would once again be figuring this out, making this reliable and figuring out all the microfluidics and fluid dynamics and figuring out, okay, are we maintaining equal pressure? Are the tray, or are the Petri dishes further in the back here gonna get the same flow as these up here in the front? Are going sideways, is it gonna get equal flow? How hard is it going to be to actuate those injectors, those pipettes to reach in and deal with the fluid? That would be the hardest part. But once you've got that company partnership, once you've got the company on board doing this, let's say it's HP or it's Dell or some other large enterprise company, now they've got a customer. They have a customer who's using a modified product of theirs, consulting them for their services. They get to say, hey, look at us. We're helping to fight, you know, uh, extinction. We're fighting, you know, these disasters that are happening to wildlife. We're doing important genetic research for curing diseases if there's labs interested in looking at it this way or supporting nonprofits you know this becomes marketing material for them and it costs them less than having to engineer their own system from scratch or and it gains them more money theoretically than just being a service provider to the labs who are getting their incubators and you know actual data collection tools separately so this gives them a close tightly knit partnership they can advertise with, they can have support, they get a full house, full in-house integration. This is definitely something that if it gets enough momentum behind it, for sure, would be practical. Another idea I had was for sample thawing, and this one's a little less far-fetched. How about a kitchen mixer attachment? You make your impeller, you got a holder for your vial, you get your bowl, you put some water in, you attach a heater to the bowl, cheap heater, thermometer, maybe an Arduino or Raspberry Pi. You need a 3D printer if you want to make the impeller yourself, but that's about it. Obviously some programming is required, but if this is going to happen, it's probably going to be someone's senior engineering project. I'm sure there would be at least primitive but workable software written for this. But let's say they get it good enough. Put your sample in, set the temperature and timer, walk back to your office or your workstation, and if the software is advanced enough, it'll notify you when it's done with a text, email, or desktop pop-up. The entire idea here is, once again, to adapt existing technology and existing knowledge to solve problems. Even if there may seem to be, even if they may seem to be completely unrelated at first glance, by partially automating the lab work for nonprofit labs where time is money and they don't have interns, their effectiveness could go through the roof. There are already lab systems, but they're proprietary and expensive, so it's all at the mercy of these companies. 
I want to work on this with the goal of overlapping problem solving. The more reinventing and the more propriety is involved, the less effective it is and the more expensive it is. This is why platform utilization is such a big deal. This is easy enough to do with existing equipment or just throwing stuff together from a hardware store and once again, this is the way I think about things. This is one thing you'll see on the channel again and again. I'm one of those knuckleheads who takes ideas from far and wide and I smash them together. I see what sticks. Throw science against the wall, see what sticks. And this is just another example of that. You know, there's a lot of people who want to go into engineering who don't have a plan in mind, and that's okay. Sometimes it takes not having a plan to come up with a new idea. But, you know, just do what you want to do. Try it out. Check out new things. So I figured, I figured I've been talking about this for long enough. I mean, how long am I going on for? Oh well, whatever. I've been talking about this, going on about this for a while, and I just figured it was worth, you know, worth sharing because this is an interesting project, and there's a lot of interesting projects out there. If you've got the mind for this and the tenacity for this, go for it. You know, the world's always open to people who've got a bright idea, but you got to be willing to put the effort out there first. And I hope this is interesting. You know, again endextinction.org. Try to donate, see if you can spread the word. They need money right now and they're doing a really good job. They're working for a really good cause. If you've watched this far in the video, thank you and have a nice day.